Bed with Things, Acts chapter 3. And uh, we'll stand and read a few verses if you can. There they are. We moved things around a little bit and lost my glasses. So I've lost other things and found them besides my hair. But uh, here we got my glasses. We're good. Acts chapter 3, look at verse number 12. When Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up, and denied him in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One, and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers, but those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Let's uh, pray and we'll be seated. Lord, I thank you for uh, your word. I thank you for um, the way you work with it in spite of us. But God, help us to be a, um, a benefit and an asset uh, to assist your word and to pro- promote it, publish it, and um, Lord, to provoke one another with it. Uh, we, we sure need you today more than ever before. God, I stand before you, um, and I pray that uh, you'd be able to use this uh, temple uh, for your service today. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, uh, this, this continuation, these chapter 3 and 4 are all um, uh, involved with this miracle that happened with the man that was lame from his mother's womb, laid at the gate, and then uh, went leaping and walking and leaping, praising God right after he was healed. I love that, that you found him in the temple after he was healed. Amen? Uh, I, it's a great, great sign. Boy, uh, one of the points of uh, Monday night's message uh, from Brother Rick Coram was, remember the prodigal son and his brother? And his brother would not go into the party. He wouldn't go in. And he said, that's a picture of a lost church member all around all the good things, but would not take part in the worship and in the party when someone else got saved. When someone gets saved, and I, I would, not everyone works on my timing, but when you really get saved, you, I, I believe that you want to do something for the one that saved you. Not pay him back, you can't pay him back, but my goodness, when it registers what God has given me, Boy, it, it should just change a lot of my attitude about him and about things around. And so um, this man who was, who was healed, he was found in the temple. And uh, then all these people, you find out there's at least 5,000 of them around the temple. I was there. It's big enough that that temple mount, it's, it's a huge space. You could have 20,000 on that temple mount, I'm sure, if there, if there was an event. Plenty of room to, to house people, and at least five thousand of them, according to Acts three or Acts four four, believe after they saw and heard what had happened to this man. So, just as many got saved at the healing as did at the uh, the tongue service when they spoke with miraculous tongues, and the three thousand were baptized on that day. Five thousand believed on this day. So, which is the greater miracle? Uh, I don't think we can compare it, but just showing you that all those things were done so that people could believe what they were saying. Well, when you study the Bible, every verse is, is written for a purpose, for doctrine, for reproach, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, righteousness. Every verse, there's a doctrinal reason the verse is in there. One more time. 
got to fake that third one so I'm a genius, right? Okay. Uh, somebody told me if you sneeze three times, it shows you're a genius. So I usually fake the third one whether I have to sneeze or not. I don't have to, have to do it, just two today. But anyway, um, you, can, you can look at the Bible verse, and there's a reason it's there. We may not always find it or interpret it correctly, but there is a reason that God wrote every verse in the Bible. I, I'm amazed at, at the names that I can't pronounce, and then when you learn something about it, you're like, wow, I'm glad that crazy name was in there. I didn't know what, how to pronounce and tried to skip over. But there, there's reasons for everything. There's also devotion or application in verses. So look at verse number 12. Peter answered in the people, you men of Israel, why marvel you at this? Or why look you so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? Now, he's talking physically. And he says, we didn't do it. We, we don't have the power. And I, I believe that um, none of us have the power uh, to make anyone else walk with the Lord either. Now, this is just devotional. But when someone can walk and decides to walk with the Lord, it's not going to be our doing. We can point, we can assist, but ultimately, if you're going to walk with the Lord, guess who's got to decide it? It's got to be you. If you're doing it for someone else, then it won't last very long. If you're trying it uh, for your own betterment, you'll not see the effects and the, uh, the, the conclusions that will always convince you. You have to do this because of God's power. And, and I'm talking about spiritually, we say we're walking with the Lord. You're walking with the Lord, and you're close to the Lord. It's going to have to be your decision. Now, when you decide to, I think you'll watch and see how other people walk and say, hey, that'll help me walk with the Lord. Hey, I can do that. Wow, that's a good idea. Oh my goodness, I bet if I tried that, it would help me walk better. But it's, you're not going to walk because of someone else. You're going to walk because of the power of God. Does that make sense? When they saw this, Peter's like, why are you looking on us? Why look on us? We're unholy. Look at verse number 13. Not that they were horrible men, but he said, it's not by our own power or holiness. They're not holy enough to make people get healed. And you know what? I don't think any of us are holy enough to get someone saved. I think you need to be holy so God can use you. But it's not going to be from our own holiness. They're unlearned. Look at chapter 4, verse 13. They're unholy, they're unlearned. Acts chapter 4, verse 13, same story, just continued. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were what? It won't take you long to hang around me or Will and say, well, they don't really know all the things that they're doing. They're unlearned men. We didn't go to Bible college. We went to the, the, the Smithsonian Institute. I went the first generation. He went the second generation with Pastor McInerney. But we, were, we just tried to learn the Bible. And really, it's the Holy Spirit that teaches the Bible. Uh, and I, I, I will say, um, I'm amazed that um, when, when the Lord teaches me something new, and, and I, it's, it's to him, it's his credit, if we can gain any of these things. But they perceive their unlearned men. Have you ever been around a professional and realized they don't know what they're doing either? Well, they're supposed to be the professional. You call somebody and you get an assessment, you're like, wow, I don't feel so dumb. They don't know what to do either. Not, not, not everywhere, but I, I realize that we're all just people trying to get through. And especially when folks are practicing medicine, I tell people I'm practicing religion. You are all my, you're all my, uh, my uh, uh, um, patients here. We're practicing religion on you. But we, we are all um, faulty, fallen, unlearned men. And they recognize that when the miracle happened, hey, it wasn't our holiness. It wasn't their learnedness. If you want to think about Peter and John, it wasn't their, um, they, they weren't perfect. We, we went through all Peter's faults, and John doesn't have as many, but 
uh, maybe John has a little bit of religious pride because he, he lists his name quite a few times. The Holy Ghost let it happen. I can't argue with Scripture, but he says, you know, the Lord put his uh, let uh, on the one he loved and, and, and things of that nature. And, and I ran faster than Peter. I got to the, the tomb before he did. I'm like, how did the Holy Ghost let him write that? That's like, that's like me uh, uh, teasing with my buddy Mike Purden about basketball. Uh, Mike, uh, we, we went to high schools that were close together, and Mike's team was 0-20 his senior year. I remind him of that every chance I get. But since he's been a preacher, his church has won basketball at camp like eight years in a row. It's really getting disgusting, okay? It, it's just sick. And now he has an ex-NBA player coming to his church. I'm like, you make me sick, Mike Bird. And he just, he's just blessed with basketball players all around. I know they're attracted because he's such a horrible one. They got to help him out. They're not, they're not perfect men. And guess what? They're not wealthy men. They said, silver and gold, have we none? If it was about paying and buying and, and living their, their most prosperous life now, Peter and John were not TV evangelists. Uh, they, they, they were not superstars of religion. And in fact, uh, even, even at the Church of Jerusalem, where they both stayed, they both stayed there. You find out later that that church was impoverished and asking for help from the other churches to send relief to Jerusalem. So it, it was not money. They said, why look on us? And I know that, that you, if you come to Bible Baptist Church, you look up here and you, you see whoever is behind the pulpit. Our, our teaching style in Western civilization is a teacher and pupils. That, that's the way that, that we have been taught to learn, conditioned to learn. Um, a lot of times in the Eastern culture, a mentor would be one who you lived with. Now, y'all ain't moving in my house. We ain't got enough bedrooms, okay? <laughs> Not going to happen. But you would, you would walk life with, you would go with them places, and that's how you would learn what they were teaching. Jesus did that. Uh, when he sat them down to teach, they, they were following him eating with him, all those things. It wasn't just a Sabbath day that he did the miracle of fish and loaves. No, there was, there was other days that, that he was teaching and preaching to them. They, they were just sharing life. But as you look up here, I hope that you don't stare too long at whoever it is behind the pulpit. Um, man, it, it's a difficult thing for me to even analyze when we try to plan for camps and speakers and you're trying to judge who you want to ask to come preach. That really bothers me that, that I have to even think about, well, we don't want this guy because he does this or does that. You know, whoever's behind the pulpit, it's God that has to do something. And I, I really appreciate one of the preachers at camp. He said, I don't care who we get, God's got to do it. It doesn't matter who we get. God's got to do it. Um, and, and boy, I hope you have that attitude that when we learn um, anything good that's done, it's not going to be from the person. It's going to be from the, the prince of, of, of life. It's going to be from the potentate, the, the one who, our high priest that's above. So they said, why are you looking at us? Then look at verse 13. Who do you look to? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus. That's who you need to look to. And he begins to preach Jesus. He's going to preach Jesus because he's going to ask them in verse 19 to repent. Well, the only way I believe that we can expect anyone to repent is if we reveal unto them the person that should make them repent. We have to reveal Jesus and all his goodness and glory and all of his righteousness and, and uh, perf perfectness so that someone will say, wow, I need to change my mind. I need to change my action. I need to change my behavior and attitude because now I'm looking and seeing who Jesus is. Jesus must be lifted up if anyone's going to be drawn to him. 
And so who do you look to? Notice in verse 13, he says, this, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that brings up their history. It brings up their, their national uh, heritage. And then Peter claims that the God of those patriarchs, that he glorified Jesus. The one who they revere and respect in their mind, they said, that God, he glorified Jesus. He talked high of Jesus. He spoke nothing but accolades about Jesus. So if you think the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is your God, then you better look to who he's talking about. If you think that he's so good, which he is, he glorified Jesus. And now notice what he says they did. He says, you delivered him up. Verse 13, whom you delivered up. Number two, who you denied in the presence of Pilate. Number three, Pilate was determined to let him go, and you changed his mind. That's something. Delivered him up, denied him. He, Pilate was determined to let him go. And then the next verse, in verse 14, and you desired a murderer instead of Jesus. I wonder if, if you were put on the spot. If you're not going to worship Jesus who are you going to worship? If you're not going to sacrifice for Jesus, who will you sacrifice for? If you're not going to serve Jesus, then what will you serve? And boy, I I love sports, but I hope that I've still got, you know, maybe three, uh, maybe two thirds of my life to live or, or a third, third of my life to live, or, or, or whatever, three-eighths left. Sports are not going to be a big part of my life going forward. I shoot some baskets, and I'm tired after shooting, not even running after. I, I'm, I'm tired running after my rebounds instead of running down the court. It, it, I love sports, and I enjoy them, but to think that that's going to be your whole life is just foolish. Hey, I enjoy making a dollar. I enjoy uh, uh, doing some work around. But if all if that is all of our life, it's going to be the market can change in a moment. All that money is saved can be worth a lot less with inflation. People, just think about that. They said they desired a murderer instead of Jesus. And you know who the murderer is? The Bible says the devil, he was a murderer from the beginning. He's a thief. He steals, kills, and destroys. And if we're not serving Jesus, if he's not the number one, then something that steals, kills, and destroys is. I'm preaching to the choir, but I'm just telling you that to encourage your faith. Why Why do I serve Jesus? Because everything else is a lie. Everything else is not eternal. And so then, notice this. Go back to verse 13. It says they denied, they denied him in the presence of Pilate. In verse 14, it tells you not only in the presence, but it tells you the person that they denied. Look at verse 14. But ye denied, what's it say? The Holy One. Now, we can, uh, we, call, we call the Trinity the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And we talk about resisting the Holy Spirit, resisting the Holy Ghost, because that's the one who we're dealing with primarily on a daily basis. Does that make sense? If you're, if you're feeling something from God, it's, it's not Jesus necessarily. It's the Holy Ghost that's communicating with you. It's the Holy Ghost that how you're born again. It's Jesus' blood. We're worshiping Him, but the part of the Trinity that you're dealing with is the Holy Spirit. Don't don't um, quench Him. Don't grieve Him. Don't resist Him. Is some of the phrases we used. But in this verse 14, I want you to realize what that Holy One means. And I have too many verses to even look at. This would be like a Sunday school lesson because there's too many. But I want you to just 
Look a few places with me. I'll list some more of them. If you want the rest of the verses, I can take a picture and put it on uh, the app or whatever. It's not hard. You just look up Holy One in a concordance. You can find them. But I want you to realize who it's talking about in Scripture. First, go with me to Luke chapter 4, verse 34. The Holy One. Peter is bringing up their heritage, their national um, history, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then he says, you've denied the Holy One of Israel. Luke 4.34. There's an unclean devil that comes out of a man. And in verse number 33, there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil. He cried with a loud voice. 34, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? Watch what the evil, the unclean devil says. I know thee who thou art, the what? He says, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Mark chapter 1 says the same thing. The Holy One. The devils knew who Jesus was. Mark chapter uh, 1 verse 24 Similar, the, uh, the demons are cast out in Capernaum and, and uh, unclean spirits. Sa- same story, but it says, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Go with me to the Old Testament, and I want you to see how many times it refers to this Holy One of Israel. Um, go to Psalm 16. Psalm 16, verse 10. This is the verse that Peter preached in Acts 2. It says, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine to see corruption. Pretty important because Peter said, David's bones are still with us. We know where his sepulcher is. He's corrupted. His body's been dust. This verse is talking about Jesus because he didn't stay in the grave. He's the Holy One of Israel. You follow me? And Peter's preaching that. And it's very convincing because they're not using Ephesians, Galatians, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Those aren't written. So he's using this reference of Old Testament Scripture to say, this is who you denied. It wasn't just Jesus of Nazareth. He's the Holy One of Israel. That's who you just messed up with. Psalm 1610. Don't turn here. Psalm 7122. 41. Psalms, let's go to 8918. Just getting a couple, but they're they're everywhere. I'm not. Remember in the Old Testament. There, there wasn't the word Trinity. There is a plural, let us make man in our image. You know, you can see the word God is a plural word, Elohim. I am on the end of it. It's not that it was uh, uh, totally foreign, but it was, it was, um, it was kind of uh, cloaked, if you would be. It was shadowed. It, it was not clear, this plurality of God. There is one God, right? Uh, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. They they understood this one God mentality, and that was in uh, total contrast with any other uh, foreign religion that was um, pluralistic in their their gods and had statues and gods of this and that. Israel said, no, we got one God. And and yet we see this three-in-one principle. Psalm 89, if you're there, look at verse 18. The psalmist said, For the Lord, Jehovah, if you would to spell that out in Hebrew, for all capital Lord, the Lord is our defense, and the what? The Holy One is our King. Now they could say, well, that's the same thing. Yeah, but Peter's saying, you killed the Holy One of Israel. 
The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he glorified Jesus, the Holy One. It's showing you the two, two parts of this Godhead. You see, you see what I'm saying in, in, in the message to the, in the book of Acts? Look at um, the book of Isaiah. Go to Isaiah 29, verse 23. By the way, I've skipped 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 verses in Isaiah that refer to the Holy One of Israel. Look at Isaiah 29, verse 23. The Bible says, But when he seeth his children, the work of mine hands, in the midst of him, they shall sanctify my name, and sanctify the... Holy One of Jacob, and shall fear the God of Israel. They also that erred in spirit shall come to understanding, and they that murmured shall learn doctrine. He's saying at the end this is going to happen. Notice they're going to see God and the Holy One of Israel. Look at Isaiah 41. And again, I'm skipping chapter 30, verse 12 and 15. Chapter 31, verse 1, 37, 3. 40, 25, but look at Isaiah 41. Forty-one, fourteen. Isaiah says, Fear not, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel, I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Notice He's the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Um, 43.3, Isaiah 43.3. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Sheba for thee. Notice the, thy Savior, Redeemer. He's identifying that he's going to No wonder Jesus claimed he was God in flesh. Because the Lord God promised that's what he was going to do when he came. So he would have to be those things. Look at uh, 43, 14. Thus saith the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake I have sent to Babylon, have brought down all their nobles and the Chaldeans, who cry, whose cries in the ships, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Look at Isaiah 49, 7. Can we get verse 6? Isaiah 49, 6. He said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel, I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, now look at this, and his what? To whom man despiseth, to whom the nations abhorreth, to a servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship because of the Lord that is faithful and the Holy One of Israel, and he shall choose thee. Wow, we, we know Jesus is the light of the Gentiles, and he's in this talk about being the Holy One of Israel. One more, Isaiah 54, verse 5. For thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and the re thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. It's in other places, this Holy One. It's in Hosea, Ezekiel, Daniel, Habakkuk. But in Acts chapter 3, this is a very, very intentional Jewish message. It's a message to the Jews. Our Acts 3, when he said, you denied, this is who you denied, the one that God glorified, that's who you denied, the Holy One of Israel, 
This is the one, the, uh, it doesn't say Israel, the, the holy one and the just, uh, and you denied him and desired a murder instead. So as we read this passage, and they're, they're wondering by what miracle we're getting clued in to the connection of the Old and New Testament in the book of Acts. Acts is transition from Old to New, um, but you're seeing the connections of the Old and the New. If you ever want to know, how do I witness to my, my Jewish friend? This is how they did. They brought up who Jesus was from the Old Testament. And they said, he's the Holy One. And, and, and the enemy, the devils, recognize who he is, the Holy One. In verse number 15, it calls him the Prince of Life. The word prince, when I think of prince, I think of the guy second in command. I think of the king and then his prince. But the word prince means first rank. It means ranking the highest. And so it is a term, um, a king is more uh, has to do with sovereign and authority, but when you call Jesus the Prince of Peace, it's not saying he's less than God. Because we also call Jesus King of Kings. But when it says he's the Prince of Life in, in the book of Acts, he's number one ranked. He's first in rank. He is um, the, the top of the chain when it comes to life. Are you lacking in your life? Then you probably ought to look to have more of Jesus in it. Are you missing fulfillment in life? You're not going to find it in anything else besides Jesus. You can look. You can, you can have moments when you don't realize it because there's other things around him. Jesus did have fish and loaves around him. Jesus did have some miracles around him. But it wasn't the fish and loaves. It wasn't just the miracles. It was him. He's the common denominator of finding life. And if you'll search and seek for him, I'm telling you, you'll find purpose in life. You'll find more potential in life because he's the prince of life. He's also the prince of the kings in Revelation 1. He's called the prince and savior in Acts chapter 5. He's called the, the Messiah, the prince in Daniel chapter 9. He's number one. The Messiah, the, the top rank, Jesus, that is a proper um, prince of peace, right? You said that before. It's a proper title to give him because he is the highest ranking uh, in, in those, those categories. The devil is also called prince. He's the prince of devils. He's the prince of this world. He's the prince of the power of the air. And my goodness, what comes through the airwaves, isn't it just, isn't it just ironic that that's what he's called when now that's the communication? That is the medium or avenue of all communication. It's through the air. And the devil's the prince of the power of the air. No doubt we're living in the last days when all the filth, all the muck, all the uh, untruth, it, it travels through the air. You can turn this on. No wires connected. There it is. And you get whatever you search for. Isn't that something? Sometimes you'll get what you're not searching for accidentally, but you get what you search for. When you turn these things on, be careful, not just young people, old people, middle-aged people, every people. It is a world unleashed. If your imagination is wicked, it'll find a home in the power of the air. Well, we need to get rid of it. No, it's right here. That's where the problem is. That's where the problem is. It's right here. It's manifested right here or right here, or right here, or right here. But it's always, this is the issue. Guard your heart, for out of it comes the issues of life. How do I clean it up? How do I filter it? The only way I know is just to get all of this all through me. That's the only way I know to clean up this heart. To read it, listen to it, think about it, meditate on it. And the more that you get in here... And here, it's better than just on here. Amen? Yeah. That was just illustration. But um, you, you got to apply it. you you got to spend time with it. And, and that it cleans, man, my heart. It's amazing what, what comes out of here. And I think, 
Where'd that come from? Well, I don't have to look at anybody else. It came right here. And that, that's the acknowledgement that it's here. It's in my heart. And so cleanse my heart. Purify me. Um, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to thy word. And so the, uh, um, man, the, the issues of life are out of that heart. And you see that um, the prince of the power of the air, he's accessible for anyone who wants it. But so is Jesus. They chose a murderer. You delivered him up. You denied him in the presence of Pilate. When he was determined to let him go, you made him keep him. And then you desired a murderer instead of the Messiah. Isn't that crazy? You desired a murderer instead of the Messiah. Why would they do that? Look at verse number 17. And I'm over time, and I'll stop. And now, brethren, I what that through, what's it say? Ignorance you did it, as did also your, even if it was out of ignorance, even if it was out of our inherited sin nature, even if it was out of just our investigation and, and not intentional, he says, repent. That's what you do. You say, I'm wrong, and repent. Well, I don't think it'll fix it. Well, you sure ought to try it first. Repent. Say, I'm sorry. Humble yourself. I don't think it's going to fix it. Well, that's what, that's what the Bible says would fix this. If you've ever done someone wrong or done something wrong and you don't know how to fix it, how did you get right with the God of all creation? You repented. It'd be a great place to start in any other relationship or any other situation. Just repent. I did wrong. I want to apologize. Well, they won't forgive me. Well, this is, I'm sure they had these same thoughts. What do we do now? We just crucified Jesus. What do we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized. Here he says, repent and be converted. That changing of mind, changing of heart is the key. And you let God work out the rest. I'm amazed that God forgave me. I'm amazed that God still forgives me. Amen. But it always comes after repentance. So ignorantly, intentionally, still the answer is repentance. Every head bowed. Lord, I pray that you would cause us to repent today. Lord, that you would give us a spirit and a heart to repent when we do wrong, say wrong, act wrong, think wrong. I pray that that we would realize and just come in front of your feet and in front of the feet of others and say, I did wrong. I, I, I just want to repent. I want to say I'm sorry. I, I want to ask you to forgive me. And just see and watch what God does with that. Well, God, thank you for being our example. Lord, I pray that I would be able to forgive others because of the forgiveness that I have received myself. Lord, help us to be mindful that even in ignorance, there still needs to be repentance. Well, I didn't know I did wrong. He still said repent. Well, I didn't mean it wrong. He still said repent. Lord, help us to, to take this example. And then, God, that I would measure who I'm desiring. When I deny you, I'll be desiring the prince of the power of the air uh, the murderer, the deceiver, the liar, uh, the, uh, to reign and, and to have his way instead of yours. Lord, convince me and cause me to come to those realizations in my life. Thank you for the lesson on you being the Holy One of Israel.